Hey guys, Jonathan here at Night Knowledge. Today we're going to look at the rules of Food Chain Magnet. I was spoiled in my first playthrough of the game to have a veritable master of board games that was able to explain the rules quite well to my group of friends. A year later, I had purchased it as well, having had an absolute blast. In Food Chain Magnet, you are a food chain company, and your goal is to have the most amount of money when the game ends. The game ends when the bank runs out of money for the third time. This is dictated by how much people have bet or drafted on at the beginning of the game, which are in increments of $100, $200, or $300. Players earn money by selling food to the houses in the neighborhood. Households are easily influenced by marketing, which comes in the forms of billboards, which only affect adjacent houses, which lasts for a maximum of two turns, mailboxes for any houses on the same side of the street without crossing the street for a maximum of three turns, airmail along either a vertical or horizontal line of tiles for a maximum of four turns, and radio broadcasts which affects the tile it sits on and all surrounding tiles for a maximum of five turns. Each source of marketing, phase six of seven, tells an affected household what one food source, burgers, pizza, soda, beer, or lemonade, they desire for the next dinner time phase, which is phase four of seven. A house printed on a tile does not have a garden and can only desire up to three tokens worth of any kind of food. A house with a garden can desire up to five tokens worth of food. During the dinner time phase, starting with the lowest numbered house, it is determined which restaurants sell to a household. To sell to a household, a restaurant will need to have one, be able to reach the restaurant by road, which in this case is Santa Maria Pizza, and two, have produced the exact number of food or drink that a house desires. For example, House 13 wants one beer, so a restaurant will need to have produced at least one beer via one of these cards over here with the green background, either the errand boy, cart operator, truck driver, or Zeppelin pilot. House 18 wants one beer and one pizza, so a restaurant will need to have produced at least one beer and one pizza. Restaurants cannot sell partially to households, so a restaurant cannot sell only one beer to a house but needs a pizza as well. If there are multiple businesses that have the desired food that the household wants, the household will then go to the cheapest restaurant this is determined by a formula of cost is equal to price plus distance. Price. Each food token is worth $10. There are three cards that influence the price. The pricing manager and the discount manager, which decreases the cost, and then the luxury manager, which increases the cost. Distance. If the restaurant is on the same tile as the house, such as Go Duck Diner in this situation, then the distance is considered zero. Santa Maria Pizza is considered one tile away. Each tile away a restaurant is from the house, the price increases by one. If neither house is using a worker, that influences price to alter the prices, the food at Go Duck Diner here is $10. The calculation is price of 10, distance of zero, so 10 plus zero is equal to 10. For the food at Santa Maria Pizza, the food costs $11. The calculation is price of 10, distance of one tile to the house. 
So 10 plus 1 is equal to 11. So in this situation, the household will go to uh, Go Duck Diner because it is cheaper. Each pricing manager used by a restaurant decreases the price by one. So per the previous example, Go Duck Diner has no pricing managers, so their overall cost is $10. But if Santa Maria Pizza has one pricing manager, the calculation is modified as follows. Cost is equal to price plus distance minus pricing manager. So the price is 10 plus a distance of 1 minus 1 pricing manager. So 10 plus 1 minus 1 is equal to 10. So in this case, the Go Duck Diner and Santa Maria Pizza have the same cost of food of $10. In cases of ties, the restaurant that sends more waitresses to work wins. If there are ties in waitresses, the restaurant in earlier turn order wins. At the beginning of each turn, players take their hand of workers and decide which ones they'll play under their CEO. A CEO has three slots under them, meaning they can play up to three workers. The order in which the workers are placed matters. Workers with the black background can only be placed under the CEO. They cannot work under another card, even if it's another black background worker. So the management trainee cannot go there. It would have to be under the CEO. There are four cards that allow a player to hire a new worker. The CEO, the recruiting girl, the recruiting manager, and the HR director. A player can only hire workers from the far left column of the help sheet. A player obtains a higher skilled worker by using a trainer, guru, or coach. To train a worker, the player needs to have set the worker aside, considered at the beach, and the worker cannot have been used in the workers sent to work. Whether a worker has been assigned to work or not, their salary must be paid. Workers with the money symbol on the bottom right has a salary of $5. Salaries are paid on the fifth phase. If salaries cannot be paid, the player must choose which workers to discard. After players decide which workers they will employ in Phase 1, in Phase 2, they will call out how many slots they have open. The player with the most amount of open slots in their hierarchy gets the opportunity to change their position. Once a position is selected, it is blocked. The next player with the most open slots picks an open position. If there are any ties, the player in earlier turn order picks first. If you had an example like this, where Golden Duck Diner is first, Santa Maria Pizza is second, Zango Blues Bar is third, Gluttony Incorporated Burgers is fourth, and Fried Geese and Donkey is fifth. If, for example, Gluttony Incorporated had the most amount of slots open, they got to choose which position they'd like to move to. They can stay the same, go to fifth position, or go higher up in turn order. In this situation, let's say that Gluttony Burgers has decided to want to go first. That will block number one. If, for example, Fried Geese Donkey was second in terms of slots, the most amount of slots, they could choose where they want to go. And maybe in this situation, they want to stay where they are. If Golden Duck Diner 
and Santa Maria Pizza were tied in the amount of open slots but, and were more than Zango Blues, Golden Duck Diner would get to choose position first due to prior turn order positioning. So the Golden Duck Diner might choose to go second. Then it would be up to Santa Maria Pizza to choose position. Maybe they'll go fourth. And then Zango Blues, because they had the least amount of slots open, they don't get a choice and they'd be relegated to the third slot. So that covers the critical rules to Food Chain Magnet. While the host sets up the game, I would highly recommend the players to review the menu booklet, specifically looking at the types of workers available and the milestones on the back, which act as passive bonuses. I am by no means an expert to the game, but feel free to leave any questions in the comments below. I hope this will help you understand how the game works and how to provide a way to explain it to your party members. Check out the rest of my channel for other videos specifically on board games. Subscribe to keep up to date on my future videos. I do intend on doing at least two more videos on Food Chain Magnet, specifically restaurant placement strategies and general strategies. Finally, check out my blog where I post about a myriad of things ranging from board games, learning opportunities, and photography. Thank you for joining me today on Night Knowledge. I'll see you next time.